there was that, that fear that just kind of was right underneath everything. That I better make sure I'm right with God. And if I haven't asked for forgiveness, I'm always just one sin away from going to hell. The devil is ready to take me down. He's going to take me down. And so all of these topics, I, I don't... I don't think it's biblical, and I don't think it's healthy, and I don't think it's helpful for us to live paralyzed by fear. You, you maybe have heard this, but the most often repeated command of Scripture is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Which tells me this. God is not interested in you and I living our lives and our faith out in fear. And, and even in fear of the enemy or enemies. And so part of why I'm talking about this too is when you talk about the concept and the topic of the devil, Satan, we're going to take a look at this. What I want to do is, my hope for you is this. By the end of this sermon, you and I are at least challenged to step back and think, huh, I've never really thought that much about what the Bible has to say about the devil. Meaning this, that sometimes this sermon, as I was preparing for this, I had, I had no idea so many references in Scripture and, and what the Bible does in terms of the way that the character of Satan kind of develops through Scripture. So in some ways, this kind of sounds like a bad word, right? Because it sounds sometimes it's a bad word for us. But the devil evolves in Scripture. All right? So in some ways, there's an evolution of Satan through Scripture. Meaning, from Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, it's like he grows. And he gets bigger and meaner and nastier and uglier. And, and from the very get-go of, of the topic of Satan, it's kind of like, wait, he doesn't seem to be this evil red demon in the pit of the abyss in, in the book of Revelation. But by the time we get to Revelation, the devil is in full force, as ghastly as possible, all right? So, so what I want to do is I want to just help you understand a little bit better the concept of the devil in particular today. And, and I think this, too, that sometimes we talk about the devil, we're, we're, more, we, we're talking more from literature outside of the Bible than we are talking about a biblical understanding. So we've been really, culture's really been shaped by Paradise Lost by John Milton. We've been really shaped by Dante's works in the Inferno. We've been really shaped by Hollywood and all of the movies about the devil and Satan and demons. And many of those things have no biblical precedent whatsoever. It is the imagination of the human who's fascinated with fear and evil. And so we find creative ways to try to personify it and talk about it and show it and tell stories of it. And, and, and the fact that there are some people, some of you, I know some of you love horror movies. Which is interesting, because it's like some people, some of us, some of us are attracted to like the fear. We, we want to get scared. We want to be scared. And, and so part of this is I, I want us to really take a look at Scripture. And so I'm going to show you several Scriptures this morning that, that talk, that use the term Satan. And you're going to see kind of what happens as the Scripture, this evolution kind of takes place in the devil, right? So this is what I want to do. We're going to start here. What does the Bible teach us? The term Satan. So when you're talking about this, is a Hebrew word. The term Satan, Satan, is how you would say it in Hebrew. So you just practice your, I, do you believe in Satan, right? Or believe in Satan. So Satan is the word. Although the biblical stories of Satan may vary, his role is always an adversarial one. The word Satan has been variously translated to mean adversary, obstacle, opponent, stumbling block, accuser, or slanderer. And this is a book, Ray and Mowgli, they're two biblical scholars. They wrote a book called The Birth of Satan. Which I, after I read that book, I thought it really should be called The Evolution of Satan. Um, the Birth and Evolution of Satan. But, but what I love about these biblical scholars, they give us the basic, basic understanding of what does the word Satan mean. And so when you and I say things like, hey, I'm going to just play the devil's advocate here for a moment. We say that, right? And what does that mean? What is the devil's advocate? What's the role of the devil's advocate? I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to oppose you. I'm going to give you the other side of it. I'm going to push back. I'm going to be an adversary right now to get you to think through this. And so we use that word, the devil or Satan. That is the basic understanding in Scripture of what Satan means. All right? Now let's go to the word, the word devil. The term devil is from the Greek. So now you get to the New Testament. Satan is the Hebrew term. Devil is the Greek term. The term devil is from the Greek. Diabolos, the translation of the Hebrew word Satan. Itself the source of the term, capital, Sa capital S, Satan. The Greek word diabolos and the Hebrew word Satan mean the same thing. They refer to a character in opposition, an adversary, enemy, or slanderer. Okay, so that gives you, now when you hear somebody say Satan and devil, we're talking about the same, same word, same meaning. It's just the Hebrew versus the Greek. Satan and devil, interchangeable. Okay, let's, let's keep moving along. <clears throat> so here's where the first appearance of Satan in Scripture is in, the term Satan is in 1 Samuel 29.4. And, and you need to know this. So, 
Satan, the term Satan in the Old Testament will come up in two different ways. As a human adversary, adversary and an angelic adversary. So you get two different concepts of Satan in the Old Testament. This is the first appearance as a human adversary. But the Philistine commanders were angry. Send him, they're talking about King David, send him back to the town you've given him, they demanded. He can't go into battle with, with us. What if he turns in battle and becomes our Satan? Becomes our adversary. This is the first time you see the language of Satan. The same word that we're going to do. You're going to see the difference in Job here in just a couple minutes. But this is the first time you see the word used for a human adversary. So is it Satan? We're, we don't, there's no Satan with horns and a beast yet. This is just the term as it first appears in Scripture. So you get this idea. And this whole story is the background of David fights along with Philistines for a little period of time while King Saul is wanting to kill David. And so now the Philistines are like, well, what if David turns his back on us? He, and he becomes an adversary. He becomes a Satan to us. Let's keep moving on. 2 Samuel 19.22. Who, who asked your opinion, you sons of Zariah, David explained. Why have you become my Satan, my adversary today? Let's keep, go, keep going on. we got a couple more on the human adversary. 1 Kings 5.4. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. This is Solomon speaking. And there is no Satan or disaster. I intend, therefore, to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God. So here's just another, it's just another nuance of how the term Satan is used in Scripture. That Solomon says, hey, this is a great time to build a temple for the Lord. I've got no adversary. I've got no Satan on any side. No country is going to be an adversary to me. So you see the language of Satan being used here. Let's keep going. Okay, 1 Kings 11, 14. Then the Lord raised up against Solomon a Satan, Hadad the Edomite, from the royal line of Edom. And again, 1 Kings 11, 23. And God raised up against Solomon another Satan, Grazen, son of Eliada. Now, what I love about this, this Solomon story, what happens here, the reason God raises up an adversary, the reason God raises up a Satan, an adversary, two different kings, this is right after Solomon's great sin in Scripture that says, and then Solomon loved many foreign women. And because he did what was evil, he intermarried with foreign women. It wasn't that he had many wives. That wasn't the sin. It was foreign wives was the sin when you read when you're reading Kings. And you find out, so what does God do in response to the sin? He raises up an adversary against Solomon and Israel. And so this is the way the term is used. Now we're going to start to see a little bit more of a development here. So here's the first appearance of Satan as a non-human adversary. So when you're reading in Numbers 22, this is the story of Balaam and the donkey. Um, what a fun story to read. So yeah, if you haven't read up on Balaam lately, this is just a fun little story to read. Um, but Numbers 22 says this, the angel, they, sorry, I got a typo here. The angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? Here's the angel of the Lord speaking. I have come here to be a Satan to you. I've come here to be an adversary to oppose you because your path is a reckless one. So this is, this is fascinating. So when you're, this is the fun when you actually, when you're able to know what the Hebrew is saying, you're like, wow, so the same word is used here as then later we'll see the term Satan used in a different way in the story of Job. Okay, let's keep going. Here's the term. Now this is, this is, I'll give you the definition here. Hasatan, so you see the word Satan. That H-A-S, that is the, simply the definite article, the. So Hasatan is a specific character found in the book of Job. It's a combination of the definite article, the, with the term Satan. So when you're reading Job, in the first two chapters of Job, for example, what you're going to find out is Satan is the Satan. It's not just Satan, it's the Satan, meaning the adversary. So let's take a look at how Job, how, how Satan, the, the characters talk about. This is Job 1, I think verse 6. I apologize, I forgot the, the actual verse on here. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Hasatan also came with them. The Lord said to Hasatan, where have you come from? Hasatan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Go ahead and go to the next one. So Hasatan, it appears, has a special function in the divine government. To audit human virtue. I love this. So, so the role of Satan is this auditor of human virtue. How virtuous are people really? So Hasatan does not seem to be stirring up trouble on earth, at least not yet, but merely reporting into his supervisor. So the Satan character is part of the divine heavenly council in the book of Job. And that's why Job is such a tough, tough, tough book to read because you're thinking, wait, what in the world is going on with this conversation between God and the, the Satan character? Let's, let's keep going. We'll, we'll see a little bit more development. So Hasatan's function in the prologue, the beginning of Job, 
seems merely to administer the test. So here's Satan's role in Job. Administer the tests that the Lord says, hey, I'm giving you permission to. To aid the Lord by finding out if moral virtue is more than skin deep. And then Hasatan does not act without the Lord's permission. And must play by the Almighty's rules. Alright, so that's the book of Job. So at this point in the Old Testament, that's about as ghastly as Satan gets. He has to play by the Lord's rules. He only does what God gives him permission to do. Now this is, so this is a little bit different as we are going to get ready in the New Testament here in just a moment. But there's another, another verse I want to show you where in the Old Testament, a change starts to happen as Satan becoming this separate character. So here we go. David's census of the people. When David counts the people, he takes a census of the people. Samuel's version tells us this. It says, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel because of their sin. And he, the Lord, incited David against them, saying, go and count the people of Israel and Judah. That's how Samuel tells it. Now you get to Chronicles, which is written several hundred years later. Chronicles has a different version. Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to count the people. Isn't this, isn't this fascinating? Yeah, I'm such a nerd, right? Samuel is telling the same story, saying, the Lord did this. The chronicler is saying, Satan did this. Which is it? And why would the chronicler's version be different? And so this is part of the development of what's happening during this time when Chronicles is being written. Let's keep going. Okay, for the first time, so this, this passage here in Chronicles, for the first time in the Hebrew Bible, Satan appears as a proper noun. Satan, no longer God's lackey as in the book of Job, stands alone in Chronicles, acting apart from the divine counsel. So this is where you start to see the shift of this character. He's becoming more than just a part of God's divine counsel. He's acting independently. So this is where you start to see the transition. Why would you see this transition? Part of what biblical scholars will say is the, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, were really influenced by the surrounding nations. They were influenced by the way they thought about good and evil. So there's a lot of influence in the way that the people were wrestling with if bad things happen, is God responsible or is there someone else responsible? 9-11. Who's responsible for that? Was that ultimately God wanting that to happen? Was that simply human free will? Is there another character involved? And it's these things are questions that people have wrestled with. They've wrestled with these questions over major tragic events. Who is ultimately responsible? And the Jewish people, early on, their understanding, just like other nations sometimes, they understood good and evil all came from the same divine being early on. So even when bad things happened, it was the reason was Floyd's week said in Sunday school. God must be punishing us for something. So God is causing something bad to happen to punish us. And so that was the worldview. And that's, some still have the same worldview too. Bad things happen. Ultimately, God is saying, well, that's a punishment for people. So what happened is during this inner ten estimate times between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, were influenced by other countries. Let me, let me show you a few things that they were, they were influenced by. So Canaan, the land of Canaan, the promised land, they, they intermixed, they intermarried. This is why God was so upset with Solomon. The Canaanite evil de deity is Molech, and he, offered, he was known for offering child sacrifices. This practice of child sacrifices continued in Jerusalem even during Jesus' day. We'll get to this next week. I'll, I'll focus on this a little bit more next week. Just outside the city in the valley of Hinnom, which in Aramaic is called Gehenna, a synonym in the New Testament for hell. It's where the Canaanite deity, Molech, yes, sacrificed children and the people and humans would sacrifice kids to the Canaanite deity, Molech. This place became known as hell. And so a lot of the references in the New Testament of, hey, you're going to be cast into hell. You're going to, to, you're going to go to Gehenna. You're going to the place where the Canaanite deity offers up child sacrifices. And it became also this place of trashy. We'll get more onto this next week. So you're like, yes, I'm back here for hell next week, right? This lets you know how it shaped the people, though. It shaped their understanding. It shaped their understanding of good and evil. So you've got the Canaanite deity. You've got also the Canaanite god, Habayu, who lived in the underworld and had horns and a tail. So this shaped the Israelites. It shaped their imaginations. Let's keep going. Also, the Egyptians got Osiris, Iris, Set, and Horus, who takes revenge on Set. Iris, in particular, was depicted as having horns. 
Horus, this is the, the all-seeing eye that's on the back of our dollar bill. That when you talk about the Freemasons, the story of the Freemasons, they're so shaped by the Book of the Dead from the Egyptians. The, the early Christians were shaped also. Early Christians and the Jews during the intertestamental times were very shaped by Egyptian, by the Book of the Dead, in their understanding of good and evil as well. Then you've got the Persian influence, which was a huge, huge influence. Persian influence brought the teachings of Zoroastrianism, which there is still some of that today, which taught that evil does not come from a good creator god named Ahura Mazda, but a malignant being called Ahriman. Both beings were uncreated. So the Persians, this is fascinating. The Persians, this is right in between the Old Testament and New Testament. When the Persians came on the scene, they said, hey, no, no, no. There's no way that you can attribute bad things to a good God. God doesn't, God, God doesn't incite his own people to take a census so that he can wipe out 70,000 people, as Samuel would say. No, no, no. The Chronicles version has been very much influenced to say, no, that's, that's Satan. Satan did that. And so this is where you get the influence of the neighboring countries in the way that the Jewish people and early Christians articulated their faith. And so then the Greek religion. This is coming right up into the New Testament. Hades, the god of the underworld, brother of Zeus, influenced Jews and Christians the most in their depiction of Satan. And so part of what I want to do with this here, now we're going to go to the New Testament and look at a few verses. This just helps you understand historically all the influences that really shaped the early Christian understanding in the way that they even talked about evil and personified evil. All right? So let's take a look at the New Testament for just a couple minutes. Here's Jesus now. Jesus in Matthew 4.10. He said to him, Away from me, Satan. Individual character, completely separate from the divine counsel. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Luke 4. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So you see how the language is much different now in the New Testament. And Jesus is even alluding to this separate character who is truly an adversary to Jesus. Someone who fully opposes the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. This is the way that Jesus is talking about this character. Keep, let's keep going. A few more verses. <clears throat> In Matthew 16, 23, this is just a different way that goes back to the Old Testament for a second. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Fascinating use because you even see this language of Satan again. You're thinking, so what is meant by this passage of Scripture? Well, it's not, no scholar looks at this and says, Satan entered into Peter in that moment. That's not what's happening here. What we understand is the language of Satan is being used to refer to someone who is an opponent and opposing the very mission of Christ. And Christ says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the ways of God in your mind right now. He's not saying you are the deep beast who is part of the abyss in the book of Revelation. You're the ancient serpent from old. No, he's using this language again of you are a Satan. You're, you're, you're a devil's advocate right now. Get behind me, Satan. Okay? A couple more verses in the, in the New Testament. John 8, 44. So John looks at it a little bit differently. He says this, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holy to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Man, okay, he is getting really, he's getting sneaky and he's getting tricky. And he's getting really grotesque too in terms of what Satan does, what the devil does, the, the, the role of Satan in Scripture. Okay, keep going. Next verse. Here's Paul in 2 Corinthians. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Which tells me, too, the way Paul talks about Satan is sometimes Satan's at work all around us and satanic forces all around us, and they're so deceptive that we don't even know it. They're influencing us, and we have no idea. Because if it was blatant, we would say, no, get away. But he disguises himself as an angel of light. Let's, let's keep going. Revelation. So here's where it gets to the full-blown picture in the book of Revelation. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown 
They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. And so what Revelation does, you need to know this. When you read Daniel and you read Revelation, those are two very particular kinds of literature called apocalyptic literature. Meaning it's high use of symbolism, high use of allegory, high use of let's try to paint big, big pictures to talk about evil. We'll talk about like a ten-headed beast. We'll talk about like a dragon. How do you talk about evil? Let's use, let's use this kind of language. And so here you have this idea and this description of Satan as the ancient serpent of old, which Revelation then understands, they read that back into Genesis in the garden. The ancient serpent of old. And then also this imagery too of it's the great dragon, it's the great beast. And here's the good news I want you to hear. Ultimately, you read this, you read all of Scripture and the way Scripture ends, it tells us this. Satan, the devil, will be defeated. That's all you and I need to know. In fact, he's already been defeated. It happened on the cross of Jesus Christ. You and I have no business living our lives in fear. We don't. Does it not mean that we don't need to know our enemy? Yes, we need to be aware. We need to know our enemy, but we don't need to live in fear. We don't need to live in fear of Satan or any satanic influence or power that's out there because he has already been defeated at the cross of Jesus Christ. And if I really believe that, and you and I believe that, our faith looks radically different than living paralyzed in fear over, what if the enemy gets me? What if the enemy gets you? The enemy was getting people in Revelation, and Christians were being slaughtered, and the church grew. And even if Christians are slaughtered again, and they are being slaughtered in other countries all around the world right now, I've shared this before, my brother in Nigeria, who's a pastor, Christians are dying left and right for their faith, and the church is growing in Nigeria. Because no matter what kind of satanic force that is out there, quote unquote, whatever powers of evil are out there, it will not overcome the church and it will not overcome Christ because Christ has already overcome it. And we live in this in-between time until we wait for the kingdom of heaven to come in its fullness. And there will still be some evil and Satan and the forces of Satan and evil will still try their best to try to bring us down and lead us astray. But you and I have no reason to live our lives in fear. We don't. I want you to, this, slide, this, this slide here, a few bullet points. I just shared one of the bullet points. But I want you to know this. This is good for you. As, you. as you look at Scripture, I challenge you and encourage you, read these verses. There are other verses on Satan and the devil. I didn't give you every reference on it, on the concept. But the concept of Satan evolves between Testaments, and it's important to remember this when interpreting Scripture. So when you're looking at the Old Testament, especially versus the New Testament, there's a whole different lens that you look at it in terms of the, the, the language just even being used. This understanding of try not to read Revelation devil language back into 1 Samuel language. <laughs> Does that make sense? So you want to know that as you're reading it and say, well, kind of the way we understand the devil, it changed over time. Okay? And then regardless, second bullet point, regardless of how one interprets the concept of Satan, Scripture points to the reality that there are forces that oppose God and are at work in this world in our lives attempting to lead us to live lives in opposition to God and his grace. And the last point, the book of Revelation reminds us that Satan and all Satanic powers will ultimately be defeated. I, I look at all this and say, Tony, why would you spend all this time telling us this? Because I think it's important for us to live out our faith in such a way that we really live, we live victoriously. That we live in the truth and the reality of what has already been accomplished on the cross of Christ. That we live as sometimes as if the cross didn't even do anything other than say, well, at least we get to be forgiven. No, what happened on the cross was the powers of darkness and the devil and demons, whatever you name it. It has been defeated. It has been canceled out. The power has been canceled out. It doesn't mean that the devil and these forces don't have a little bit of power left. And that's what Revelation points us to. But I look at this and I just want to nudge you and encourage you to that we as God's people, we don't need to live our lives paralyzed by fear. Last verse in James. I want to show you. We'll wrap up with this. What I, what I love about James is this. James starts in chapter 1 in James, and he'll say something like this. Don't say that God tempts you when you're tempted. He doesn't even say, don't say Satan tempted me. James will say this. We're tempted by our own evil desire within us. 
Sometimes the devil is in the mirror. Sometimes the adversary, the enemy of God and those who oppose God in his ways, is the person looking back in their reflection. It does not mean we dismiss a separate being, per se. That's not what I'm saying. But when you look at Scripture, especially even the way James says it, James says, we are led astray when our own evil desire from within tempts us, and we go and follow that desire, that evil desire, that sinful desire. But James will come back three chapters later or four and say this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves into God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is such good news. It doesn't matter how you understand the devil or the forces of the devil or evil powers that are at work in our lives, because I affirm those and I believe that those powers are at work in this world. But the good news is this. Whatever concept of the devil, it doesn't matter. You can and I can and we can as the church. We can resist it. We can resist those powers and what this says, James tells us, and the devil will flee from you. And I love this. If you want to use any story that gives you encouragement, it's Jesus and the temptation when Satan is, is tempting Jesus. What is Jesus' response every time? What's Jesus, what is he saying? What does he say to the devil? Yeah, yeah, he's, and that's true. He, he keeps quoting scripture. He resists him. And even de the devil, because he masquerades his name of light, he'll throw scripture back at us and try to lead us astray with scripture. And Jesus goes back and forth, back and forth, saying, no, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Submit to God. And I think that the part of resisting the devil, what's important is, for James, the way you're going to resist the devil, the adversary, is you submit to God. And I think probably, I don't know that the devil, whatever the devil is like, I don't think that the devil is really that interested in us worshiping him. I think the devil just wants us to worship ourselves. Because then he knows he has us, because then we're in complete opposition to God. It's the temptation of the garden. Be your own authority. Don't submit to anyone. Submit to yourself. Be your own God. You want to resist the devil, you submit to the Lord's authority. You submit to him. I want to do this. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to close with prayer. I thought about this during the service, and so I didn't prepare Craig, so I wasn't going to put him on the spot. There, there's an old song written by Martin Luther. I want you to hear, I want you to hear these words by Martin Luther. We all, everyone know who Martin Luther is? Not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther, who posted the 95 Theses on the, of the, the wall at the Catholic Church in Wittenberg. Yes, the Protestant Reformation started. He's known for, probably most famous known for this hymn, or one of the most famous hymns that he wrote was, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Listen to these words. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And he already has. I don't think I've cried in my fortress. Oh okay. yeah. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to try and prove us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours, through him who with us signeth. Let goods and kindred go, the mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abide still. His kingdom is forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.